In this week's episode, Jahed and I go a bit deeper into how DAOs actually work on a day-to-day basis with Daniel Ospina. Daniel Ospina comes from RNDAO, or Research and DAO, which is an innovation center with a mission to empower human collaboration. The organization exists to catalyze collaboration across DAO tooling projects as a cross-DAO innovation center focused on solutions for DAO operations and governance. We hope you enjoy the episode. Thanks for joining us today, Daniel. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So we like to start these things off just by asking, you know, a little bit about your background. Where did your story start and how did you enter the space? Sure, thanks. So there was a time where I think I was 15 or something. And and I was starting to, to try to figure out how to chase girls and I wasn't very successful at it. I was living in Colombia and Colombians really know how to dance and I didn't. So that wasn't particularly useful. But <laughs> after... Yeah, but the trick I ended up discovering after a bit was that I, I knew how to mix cocktails. And so I started doing that a bit by accident. It's a, it's a longer story that, I don't know, maybe another day, but I ended up learning that trick. And, and then through that, suddenly for the first time ever, I had this social role or this a place in the peer group that I had, which I was this person that was helping other people have a great time. And, and I really wanted the party to go really crazy and be an amazing party because then I, I, that would, I would look good and I'll be popular and I'll be happy and people would like me and so on. And, and so I kind of continued with that. And by the time I finished high school, I was in between studying cooking and law, which were two very different sides that I was interested in. I ended up doing an internship in each, completely fell in love with with cooking. It seemed way more exciting, especially came across the molecular cuisine stuff and the chef in Spain that was called Ferran Adria. Oh, yeah. It just seemed I know, like... I know Ferran. Uh, yeah. He, he multiple... He's a three Michelin star chef of... Uh, what was... The restaurant is closed now, right? Like 10 years ago, but it was like the top restaurant in the world for years, right? What was the name? Yeah, El Bulli. El Bulli. See, yeah. I remember. Cool, cool. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, that's good to know. We're going to dive into that a little bit, Daniel, but continue, please. Yeah, sure. So anyway, so this food world seemed to be just really sexy. There was technology, there was science, there was all this creativity and reinvention, and, and it seemed very, very exciting. So I, I kind of continued down that route for a while, but when I actually joined the industry and, and I was lucky, I I ended up eventually in, in France studying in um, with Paul Bocuse, who's, I think he's passed away. Well, he's passed away now, but at the time he was called the Pope of French cuisine and was this like very classical guy, but he was very emblematic in that industry. And, and so I ended up joining his school, trained under that. And then I had this first clash in between the expectations I had and, and the reality of the industry. That is, they wanted you to learn the basics. And the basics were the 17th century basics. So you had to spend all of this time learning how to cut potatoes in a perfect zeppelin shape with seven faces to the potato. And I was like, why do we spend so much time learning to cut potatoes in this shape? And they're like, oh, because it's a skill, whatever. And, and it's a thing that it was done in Paul Bocuse restaurant, which had become a sort of museum. But there isn't any other place where they do that because there is a tremendous amount of wastage. Right. Like you cut the potato into a zeppelin and everything that doesn't shift that doesn't fit into that zeppelin phase is essentially thrown away. And I was like, man, that's a lot of wastage. And I was seeing the piles of food wasted and no one seemed to care. Like no one seemed to notice this thing. No one seemed to think that how incredibly inefficient this was. And, and so it kind of started from that. And then I, I went through the industry a bit further, end up trying to chase these molecular cuisine dream and try, end up joining then different restaurants and so on. And, and every place I was going, I was sort of looking for this creative spark and this place that would feel like some sort of mad scientist laboratory. Uh, I guess it's when I was 12, I had learned in chemistry that you could make crystals. And I don't know if you, you know, those crystal kits kind of thing. Yep. So I had discovered one of those. And I guess I was looking for that all along because when I was 12, I got a bit frustrated because I couldn't join the chemistry laboratory because I first needed to learn algebra and all these other maths and, and so on. And, yeah. and so I was still kind of chasing that in some form of shape. And these kitchens that I joined, even though they were free Michelin star restaurants and some of them among the 50 best and so on, but they were still not that. They were very hierarchical places and where someone... 
yeah, <laughs> yeah, that it, it's got that reputation, right? And and to be honest, like there was something really appealing about that hierarchy and the, the extreme pressure and control is that you're chasing excellence and mm-hmm. you're trying to make to transform raw materials which are perishable each very fragile, each super expensive, like you're dealing with truffles and caviar and all of these super expensive things that can go off, you can burn it. It, And the whole thing needs to assemble just at the right time and really work together. And find the cuisine is all about these contrasts. So like something needs to be super crispy, but very delicate, very thin. And something needs to be really moist and warm and soft and melt in your mouth. You try to put something crispy and something that is very humid together after five minutes, it's just mush. And so you need to get all of these things just at the right time, just in the right way and and pushing everything to the extreme. So you get the most contracts contrast and the most wow sort of creation that you could do. So there is something fascinating as well in the sort of culture and environments that this makes where people are so damn obsessive about them. You have all of these, these chefs that work like 16, 18 hours a day, a lot of young people, and everyone is incredibly aggressive with each other, not physically, but in, in the sense of you gain status Mm-hmm. by telling other people how what they're doing is wrong. And so uh, you have... <laughs> I see some parallels to uh, to the crypto space, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least on Twitter. <laughs> oh, yeah, completely. Oh, that's funny. Right? So is, is this sort of like one upmanship or like it's a very macho sort of culture of I'm better than you and I'm the best and I'm going to tell you all how you're shit kind of thing. And that's sort of the dark side of it. But on the positive side, there is these few occasions where a team really works together and everyone respects each other and everyone is at the top of their game or really good. And because you're really trying to push the limit of what's possible day in and day out, and it's like push it to the extreme, but then make sure it stays at the extreme every single day and you can never have a bad day because people are paying $500 for a meal. And it's probably like their anniversary or even they have traveled to do these things. So it's a huge occasion. You don't really have room for error. And to get there, when it really happens, is the whole kitchen starts to work a little bit like a beating heart, where the whole team is slows down. There is a moment of calm. Then something happens. Everyone starts rushing, working super fast in perfect synchrony at the same time. And then it slows down again and the thing comes together. The plate is put there. The table goes, the waiter takes it away and everyone kind of like breathes again, cleans quickly. And then the next thing happens. And you end up getting like these perfect cycles of super intense, super fast paced work of very fragile things. And that is exhilarating, like the level of adrenaline that you get with it. You end up in, and that's kind of how you can last these 18 hours is because you're rushing like crazy, but when it works, it's beautiful. And yeah, and but then you are like, okay, the ultimate thing, like the ultimate status in this space is when you reach the top and you can be the sort of mad genius inventing these creations and and everyone is obsessed with the quality of the of the product at the end, the dishes. So you're like, wow, I, we want this to be excellent. You're it's kind of, it's a little bit like Formula One in the in the car industry. You is the place where things are pushed to the edge to the extreme, you try to make it as impressive as you can. Everyone is very passionate. And then those innovations will trickle down to the rest of the industry over time. But this is the place where they are developed. So within that sort of pyramid of an industry, you have at the top this pyramid of the of the structure where everyone aspires to be the head chef and be the, the boss and the public persona and also the one who appears on TV and in the cover of magazines and the whole thing, right? And the issue was that when I finally got close enough to these people to see them, it didn't look that great. And these guys were, well, we were a bunch of like teenagers. I think I was like 19, 20, maybe 21, 22 at the time. And some of the the other people that were like more senior were maybe like 25. There were very few in their 30s. Like by the time you were in the 30s, most people had either burnt out or they had become the boss of their own thing. And the guys who were at the top of these three Michelin stars, they had been building them for two, three decades. So they were in their 40s, sometimes in their 50s. And they were still there working crazy hours. They look really tired. They were stressed as fuck. 
And they were not even that creative anymore because they had been doing it. I don't know if it had been for too long or too much pressure day in and day out. And a lot of them end up being alcoholics or just like cocaine addicts or like there was this human drama in there that, and this one's not everyone, like some of them were very cool, but very much the exception to the norm. Like there was a guy in Italy who was super chill and let back and everyone had more time and he was extraordinary in that place, but he was very much the exception to the norm. The large majority of them were more some sort of like walking shell of a human being that had, and I was like, man, am I gonna work for like the next 30 years to become that guy? That right. sucks. That's funny. <laughs> I totally get that parallel. There's a parallel for me too. It's not the same exactly, but you know, I went to do a PhD in biophysics, right? And so I got about this, you know, doing doing that basically requires about you know sixty hour weeks paid absolutely pennies, right? Like twenty five, <laughs> thirty thousand dollars a year for five years, whereupon you graduate to being a postdoc where you get to make fifty thousand dollars a year in America. That's you know, it sounds like a lot, but in America depending where you are, that's nothing, right? And you're yeah. expected to beat yourself in the ground for another four to five years. And all to look across the hallway at your professor whose life is basically mostly the same, except he's sitting at a desk writing grants all day and looking stressed, right? So, you know, <laughs> and, and when you finally achieve like the pinnacle of your field or at least tenure, you're, like you said, in your 40s, barely in your 50s, you're washed out by then, but 40s, easily, right? And so I looked at that and I was like, that does not look very appealing, sir. So I totally get that. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And so you had like when in in talking us through this, there are a couple of really interesting things that came up. One, it sounds like you had a taste of this thing that honestly, I think this is kind of overblown, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. Uh, uh, Mihaly Ch- uh, Csikszentmihalyi's flow states, right? So like, it sounds like mm-hmm. you had a taste of flow, right? Or at least you were in flow multiple times a year, possibly multiple times a day, right? Depending on how you're working with your team. But, you know, this beating heart and everything you're kind of pointing at, that really draws you in, right? So that feeling kind of draw you in, drew, drew you in and you were like, all right, I'm going to stick with this. But it seems like that maybe was the nugget of curiosity for you that then kind of led you on a different path. Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess that's what kept me in it for so long. It was that those flow states, those those moments of greatness, and and I mean, I kept on moving different places. And you're you're trying to learn always, because if you are in this sort of like top layer, like the the Michelin star cuisines sort of ambition, what you you work a lot, you earn very little money. Like ironically, you go to a shitty restaurant, they pay you double. But if you're trying to do that thing, you really don't do it for the money. You're yeah. doing it because you love the thing. You're deeply passionate about it. And so you want to learn. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's not too different the way, because I was speaking with all of these friends who was like one who was a ballet dancer and he's kind of like the same thing. And you try to work for the top, top people. And it's not that they pay you the most. It's that that's where you learn the most and you can push your craft to the extremes. Or if you're an architect, sometimes you go to work for a really famous architect and they also exploit you a lot. Yeah. Uh, but you get the name and you get to be close to that thing that you admire. And and it's Higher anyway. And, uh, exploitation. <laughs> it's <not> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And you, if you survive it, you get to spin out and also have a reputation. Great. <laughs> Fantastic. <Exactly. laughs> so when did that sort of, so this was, you know, early, early in your career, you were fascinated by a number of things, chemistry, science, cooking. When did you begin to think, oh, okay, I gotta, I don't want to be in this and, and what came next? So, I mean, first it started with, if I want to create my own restaurant, I need to know how to create dishes because I had a lot of ideas, but then you try to make them at home and it's not really the same thing as when you have all of these professional equipment and all of these people that can do small parts of it. So together it becomes the, the real thing, right? Otherwise you, well, you need the proper equipment, the, the, the team, the whole thing. So first I was what if you could borrow some of that equipment and so on? And I ended up joining a place that actually gave some of the members the possibility to do it from time to time. And maybe like on a Sunday when the place was closed, you could come in and spend your whole Sunday because you working five days, 18 hours a day is not enough. So you come on Sunday and you try to create this thing that you really want to see 
True, which is, you know, ironically, is, is, a, is very similar to like employee ideas or innovation in the workplace. It's, <laughs> yeah. You get to work the whole week and then you can you get the luxury of being allowed to make a proposal to your boss on how to improve the workplace, but you'll have to do it on top of your job. And so anyway, so it was kind of like that situation. And the issue is the output of those things was usually really bad. And for myself as well, and I was trying to understand why is it so bad and it wasn't until I saw some of the creative process that they were going through that I understood that it was a completely different process to get to the outcome. And their the starting point wasn't so different from mine, but the process they were using to develop a new idea, a new product was radically different. And I was like, there is something there that I don't know and I need to learn. So how can I do it? And, and I ended up finding a, an internship in a research and development place, a, a department within a food group. So this was an experimental kitchen in a play, in the Fat Dog group that had a restaurant that had been voted like best restaurant in the world in 2005. So it, it had kind of like one of those, I think there is maybe like 10, 15, like Michelin level R&D labs in the world. This was one of the top. I was super excited, joined that thing. And, and after a bit, well, they actually offered me a job. So I stayed, I was working, helping to do this thing and learning the creative process. But there was still a lot of gaps. And I met this guy, this was close to London. I met this guy in London who was a lot in the startup scene and started to pass me books about design thinking and agile and all of these kind of things. And I started to read it and I was like, oh, wow, these folks are using a very different process than we use. And, and there are so a few things that we can learn from design thinking and agile and vice versa. Like there were very cool things about the sort of processes that we use that maybe the software world could learn from. But it's when I try to bring these things in and suggest to the, the rest of the team is like, hey, guys, there is this other thing that they didn't care. And there was this big resistance and very like silent mentalities. We are at the top. We know what we're doing. We're not interested in, in these other influences. And, and then the biggest lucky break or, well, one of the big lucky breaks of my career happened. That is the, the whole team got fired because they they were doing some stuff they shouldn't have and the relationship with the, the CEO, with the head chef that had started the company, had degenerated. And, and it ended up in a big explosion. And anyway, on the, there is a, a bunch of things there I cannot say because of the privacy agreement. But long story short, I ended up being the only one left because I had joined after the drama had happened, but it took a while for them to discover. So I ended up being suddenly like, I think I was like 23 at the time, and uh, in a thousand people company, I'm the only person left who has any clue how the innovation department was running and where the database is or where to find anything. And while everyone is kind of freaking out, they try to hire a new team and the new team is asking the only guy who was there before is like, so how does this work? even though they were more senior and we had like a food scientist and an engineer and pastry chefs and, and cooks, very talented senior cooks and so on, but they have no clue where to find anything or how they are meant to work as a team. And so that became my default role. And suddenly I could start to experiment and bring in a bit of the design thinking influences because they would be like, so how do we run this process? And I would be, well, it's like this. And no one could say that's not how we do it here. So I kind of stretched the truth a little bit. <laughs> that's, that's a huge benefit, right? <laughs> you, yeah. In one fell swoop, they killed the one defense everyone uses. One of the most important ones, well, that's not how we do it here. That's not how it's done. That's excellent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why face 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 of innovation opened up just by killing that one phrase? <laughs> yeah. And I... I mean, I, I loved it. Like, I really dig that stuff. I found it super interesting to start thinking more about the system and how we go from first generating ideas and what's a really good process for generating ideas and what's a really good process for selecting which of those ideas, because there are so many. And then what's a really good process for testing them and what does testing mean when you're talking about aesthetics? I think that's sort of subjective. And so we're running kind of like having all of these discussions and thinking about all of these things. Well, then what started to happen is that all of the other people who had power within this company, who had been somewhat repressed, as in like the innovation people were the cool guys. And they were the ones who got to go home at 6 or 7 p.m. while everyone else was working until midnight. They were the ones who go to go on TV and do the crazy experiments. And whenever there was like some liquid nitrogen explosion or something, it was because these guys were doing something crazy. And then the other people just had to do, like essentially follow very precise instructions. And everyone was there because they aspired to the creativity. So there was like that huge disconnect. And when suddenly when the, the authority, like the head of the research and development was gone, 
all of these other folks wanted to have a piece of that power and a piece of that authority and wanted to have their ideas. And so everyone tried to kind of like come in and influence what we were doing. And everyone thought they were a bigger expert, but they had, I mean, many of them had 20 years more experience than, than I did and, and some of the other guys with me. And everyone had worked so incredibly hard to get to where they were. And they really care about the company. Like they were coming from a good place. But in practice, this was just a clusterfuck of yeah. egos and opinions and all of that kind of like just above our heads, but really messing with the work. Got it. And so actually that last bit is, I think, a great place to then transition. Because I think like how did, so this started then, re, you then went from the, you have a really interesting background because from there, you know, you got into crypto. So how did those things happen, right? How did you go from like, you know, doing transglutaminase reactions for, you know, meat glue or what have you <laughs> on TV to then coming together and saying, great, I'm going to work in Dallas. I'm going to work for Aragon. How do, where is that? Can you fill that gap in for us? Yeah. So, I mean, after maybe a, a couple of years of these bureaucracy and experimentation and so on, I learned a lot, but I very quickly started to feel that I had reached the limit of what I could learn here because a lot of the issues were organizational and that was like within the team, I had a little bit of respect and I could influence things, but outside the team, people would be like, no, you're a cook. You don't get to have an opinion about this. And I was like, yeah, but I'm seeing all of these problems. Don't you realize that we fired that guy because he was being very toxic, but the new guy that came in who was super nice, six months down the line, he's as toxic as the previous one. And maybe it's not about the guy, it's about the way the organization is working. Maybe you're yeah. asking him to do an impossible job with free bosses and so on. And and. I don't know if it was like the way my brain worked or just simply that I was in a shitty position to have to deal with a lot of the the, con the negative consequences of it or something. But I, I, I felt that I was hyper aware about these and the rest of the organization was either not seeing it or just didn't want to have that conversation with me at all. So I, I decided to leave and I was like, I'm still... We have learned so much about how to generate ideas, how to, well, the whole innovation process and around creativity that I was like, that seems to be a really big thing outside the food world. Maybe I can do that. And, and also by that time, I was starting to feel that creating ever more complicated and expensive food for really rich people was not that fulfilling. And TV, fair, fair. <laughs> yeah, TV had a TV had a big part in killing that dream. Like they were getting convincing us to do gigantic French fries, and and I was like, but why are we doing gigantic French fries? Like there's people dying of hunger, and and I don't know. Like it just seemed completely disconnected, and it was a stupid entertainment, and there seemed to be no just disconnected from the rest of the world in this right. random crazy bubble. So I decided to leave and try to become an organization designer. I kind of struggled with that for a bit, eventually end up meeting a, a professor that took me a bit under his wing, end up doing a residency in experimental psychology for a year. That was a, a relationship that we had through the R&D. Mm -hmm. So then through that, I managed to kind of get into Oxford through, through the back door, just worm my way in through this made up position. Through that, met a, a guy in the business school. I was thinking about doing an MBA. He ended up, eventually, we ended up having a lot of conversations about innovation in restaurants. He convinced me to write. That took, well, he, he ended up having to teach me to write, actually. And But at the end of that, led to an article in Harvard Business Review. And it started to give me a bit of a platform within the university that then led to workshops. And I finally sort of transitioned into doing a bit of organization innovation consulting. And I spent the next eight years or so doing that. But every time I was still searching for, let's say, a better answer of how the people in the kitchen could work together, how the person at the top would not become that shell of a human being at the end, or how can these things work better? And can we actually all be participating in the innovation, in the creative side. So it's not some people who are just following instructions and maybe they have a lot of valuable ideas, but those are wasted. And like, I was looking for a solution for these problems. And first it was like, oh, self-management is really cool. Mm -hmm. But but then no one really wanted to implement self-management or like only a very small niche group. And it was super hard to convince anyone outside. And it just seemed to go past the head of most people. He was like, yeah, what they need is more sales. Why are you preaching about self-management? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And yeah, and I kind of just continue into that journey looking for different ways to organize and especially for people who cared about it because it just seemed that the majority of businesses were just ticking along 
and not seeing the seeing the issue, or at least like we couldn't communicate. I was coming also, you know, chef background and so on, trying to talk about innovation into a software company, and it was just too too out there. And we were in, we just didn't have the same language. They used different terms. I felt like an outsider by the way I dress, by the way I talk, by my nationality, by whatever it was. And and it wasn't until around 2018 when I when I stumbled upon Colony and then Aragon and like there was this DAO thing. And suddenly I was like, wow, these things are actually raising millions. There is a bunch of people trying to rethink from first principles how we should work together. They have huge technological capabilities, and it's kind of really happening. This seems like the sort of molecular cuisine space of management where all of these creative forward thinking people are coming together and doing something that's really pushing the boundaries. And, and I just went like straight into it. I it, Then it was only a matter of like, how can I be part of that? And at first it was really hard because I'm not a developer and, and everyone else was like, Oh, so which language do you know how to program? And I was like, um, I don't know. No, no, and no. <laughs> yeah, I can think about, you know, I can talk about innovation and leadership and management and, and in general communities. Me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, cool, I, this I, is, I, yeah. Okay, now go on. I think this is a, I've been looking forward to talking to you about this because, you know, we're on like, I think we're somewhere around episode 35 or 34 of the pod, but we have spent precious little time actually getting into what a DAO is, right? And you know, one of the things that attracted me to your work originally, you know, I think we met about a year ago or so, was that you you were really looking at this from, like you said, first principles. A lot of people just jump in and say, we're a DAO, great. We're a self-managing, <laughs> they don't even say self-managing, honestly. they say we're a, you know, we're a flat organization at best, or, you know, we don't have any bosses. But I like to start we love to dig into the jargon behind a lot of these movements. So I'd love to ask you, since this is something you have been like subsumed with for a better part of a few years, what is a DAO? I mean, the, where I'm coming at right now is that a DAO is an aspiration. And a DAO is a word we use to describe a bunch of things right now. And the fact that these both things is the most important is that the DAO is the sort of journey that we're in to discover and invent DAOs. And the DAO is also the thing that we're doing right now, which is to say a DAO is everything and nothing. Yeah. But if we actually want to really understand what is happening, we need to get rid of the notion that we're going to be able to define it statically. And we need to define it as these groups of people who are trying to achieve a thing. And if you understand what that thing is and where they are right now, and then you can start to understand the journey of where we are going as an industry and a society, which I think is a more important question than should this be called a DAO or not, which has implications more like when we start to do to discuss, like, should someone be allowed to call this a DAO or not? And we start to deal then with a very, very difficult question, which is how do we separate the bullshitters from the visionaries? from those who are trying and we have to start dealing with the most complicated thing about humans is that we're very flawed and imperfect but we improve over time and so how can you tell apart those who are actually in a growth development journey from those who are just using the buzzwords to say something else and so when i talk about the DAO, for me the key thing is is there a genuine authentic aspiration to rethink how we organize how we work together you could call it a progressive organization but specifically in the DAO case two things come into it the decentralized and the autonomous part which is about understanding how we distribute power and are we going to distribute power differently than just building these monolithic pyramids where one person tells everyone below exactly what to do and it's almost more a, a rebellion against these form that we have been using for a while that we know has many limitations. We don't know exactly what the better answer is, but at least there is a search for that better answer. And the autonomous side as well, which has to do with, again, touch upon a bunch of different things, but the self-sovereignty, do people, do you believe in empowering people? Do you believe that everyone should have the right to be a master of their own destiny? And are you trying to create relationships of equals and create agreements or on the other side, are you telling them what to do and they should follow your orders because they have no choice? 
right? And it starts to come in. And then it's the same thing about the organization with other organizations or the larger system that is in part. Is it optional or, or, or is the larger system forcing you to do certain things that you don't want against your own will and you are just having to follow with resentment and so on? And, and so it's this idea that at the end is very related to perception and psychology of how we see it, but can we create relationships of mutual benefit where everyone is thriving, where we have yeah these systems that are regenerative, that are nourishing the people and are nourishing the, the other systems that sustain it to become better and so on. So, you know, I, I gone into drop like a billion buzzwords there, but... The, you, the it's end. funny, you did you did just fine <laughs> to the <laughs> end, but it doesn't matter. I wasn't setting requirements for you. You're your own person. Define it how you want, right? I think it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I, love, I love a couple of things that you hit on there is like, how do we distribute power? And uh, the other one I'm going to put some words in your mouth really is around optionality, right? Like, are these relationships voluntary and are they nurturing? And how, once we are in them, how do we actually liberate people to make decisions and be creative, right? I think that's probably like the two high yeah. notes that I hit on there. Yeah. And so I think, you know, this is not, we've had a couple folks on the pod before. We had uh, Jeremy from Regions Unite who, who practices liberating structures and is trying to get everyone to use liberating structures, right? But I don't want to get into a specific, you know, framework. It's more about, you've touched on in general, what you're trying to spirit into the world and... Uh, one thing I really wanted to ask you is now that we've sort of had a this opening dialogue on DAOs, how do the way I think if you talk to a really you know a really in the weeds you know programmer or Web three person, right? They're like, a DAO is a set of smart contracts and a multi sig, basically, right? <laughs> if, at that point. But so I wanted to ask you, you know, in your practice so far in the last four or five years, how do these rigidly defined, you know, intersub but somewhat intersubjective software structures intersect with how you think and define DAOs, right? Where is the sort of overlap? Yeah, I see the, the for me, the tools are an enabler for something. So we're using all of these smart contracts to try to solve, or at least this is where I get excited. This is not necessarily how other people define the way they're being used, but this is the opportunity I see and actually what I care talking about, which is big part of the issue with self-management is that you had all of these other different processes that allow you to make decisions differently, to relate differently and so on. And in general, empower more people, were a little bit more fluid, gave more opportunities for the best ideas to surface and, and for the hierarchy to, to adapt to what is what was needed as opposed to being imposed from egos and, and these rigid other structures and so on. And the issue was that all of these different processes and systems and tools that have been built for that, you had to learn them and you had to change the way you were operating. And when you had learned for 10, 20 years, you know, since even since primary school, they're telling us to obey the teacher as opposed to make an agreement with the teacher about what you both think is a great, is a good relationship and so on. So you're already starting from this mindset, this old fashioned mindset from the beginning. And if you're trying to then migrate to this other, it requires tremendous amount of work and learning and memorizing like Holacracy, for example, which is one of the self-managed systems, it has a constitution and they have even trademarked the thing. And it has, I don't know, like 30, 40 pages that you need to learn about rules that are essential for this oh, system boy. to work. So, so it's a great idea, but, but it takes a lot for anyone to start being able to work with it. So the same way, if you take even a, a really basic piece of software, like, I don't know, like if you want to describe all the rules that you use or all the options that you use for Zoom for the call that we're using now between us, you will need so many pages of text to describe it. Like you imagine the, if you, the amount of documentation that teams use, well, then the UI looks really simple. And, and so it's this ability to compress a lot of behavior and a lot of information embedded into a tool that facilitates a different way of people working together. That really, really excites me. So sometimes it's about trust or not having the fear that someone is going to run away with the money. Sometimes it's about making sure that one person cannot as easily bully everyone else into agreeing with them. Sometimes it's about the way you end a relationship when both of you don't want to work together anymore. How do you do that? And 
if you can start to embed a lot of these different approaches into software, into tools that facilitate a different way to relate, it's a lot easier to sustain these alternative models of relating, these alternative models of collaborating than it's ever been before. And that's when I think it's really, really exciting is like we use this software as a tool to work in a way that would be somewhat counterintuitive, but thanks to the tool, we can dedicate our willpower because willpower is very finite. You have, you can dedicate a lot of energy to develop a habit, but if you try to do too many habits at the same time, you run out of energy and you go back to the old behavior. And so is this that for me allows us to transform the way we work and collaborate at scale, like society-wide, which is a very unique opportunity and the bit that I really care about that brings me into this industry. That's awesome. And I think now this is a great time to dig in even a bit deeper because you're one of the few people who, um, you know, self-managing organizations, self-organizational uh, psychologists, I'll, this has been an area of practice for a long time, organizational design, but you're one of the few who's like really jumped in with every one of your limbs with the, with the you know, folks who are doing, who are trying to organize this way in web three. So I think it'd be a, I'd be interested to know, like um, you listed off a lot of things that are contextual and situationally relevant, right? So maybe you could pick an example from your past, your past work in the last four years. I know you were at Aragon for a while. You facilitated their transition to a DAO. You've been working on a lot of stuff with your group in, with R and DAO, which we'll also get into. But maybe you could pick one and say, you know, here is a moment in time, right? That maybe most of us are familiar with if you're a DAO operator or if you've been involved in the community a little bit. And, you know, I, you, you can take a snapshot in time maybe of one of these situations where you can say, here's a very common pitfall, right? That, that folks are really trying to organize around. And here is how, you know, if you use one of these tools that we've talked about, you can bring clarity to what everyone's needs are and maybe walk us through an example. I'd love to hear if you can share one. Okay. I mean, there is both a lot I'm trying to figure out of a good one there. One that comes to mind that is a constant challenge, even for us at Aaron Dow, but it's something that we think a lot, is the order of a decision process. So you have some inputs, like some people are going to give information. Maybe a smaller group is going to collect that information, process it try to create an artifact, a proposal, an idea of like, this is the problem, this is the solution, this is how we think it should happen, and so on. Maybe they ask others to give them feedback, iterate a little bit. Then they're going to go and try to make it legitimate. And in theory, this process works relatively well if everyone has the impression that their voice was heard. It's not so much that the, the, the final proposal agrees with them. The important bit is they were heard. But in DAOs, what's happening very, very often is there is a proposal coming out of somewhere else. Some people don't like some parts of it, so they vote against it, or they try to squish it down, and then the proposal doesn't happen. And the proposer has spent such a tremendous amount of energy trying to craft this idea. They're probably relying on this thing working to pay their own bills or yeah. something like that. So there is this humongous amount of uncertainty and so on. And like a simple way to shift this around is to break down the agree or disagree with a process that we use at some moment that is also including the option of, I have a suggestion and let's make this a process that can expand or contract in the amount of time depending on how much discussion happens is something that is uh, sometimes referred to as lazy consensus is if no one disagrees, these things get approved. And if there is a discussion, then you open up that discussion and then you can play around with different rules and games and so on. So we are using it in, in our DAO at the beginning for operational governance. This was not to define the rules of the DAO. This was not to define how we were going to use funds, but in a small team, we could use it to make a few changes to our structure and so on, to change the way we were working together. And he was like, here is an idea. You, so you were allowed to put an idea out there that was even bad or poorly refined because you had the trust that the process itself was going to improve it, as opposed to having to work such a long time in trying to get this proposal. And then the, the other issue is like, if the first thing that needs to happen is working on this proposal almost in a silo before it's official, other people don't know 
whether this is worth being paid attention to or not. Because maybe it won't go anywhere and so on. So people kind of only pay attention when it's the moment to say approve or reject. And so all of that collective intelligence is being lost and all of that feedback is not happening beforehand. And also it's kind of like brutal. If someone comes like, you're like, whoa, man, I don't know about that thing. Wait a second. I just, I'm just starting to feel my way around that I haven't thought yeah. about the topic and so on. So, yeah. so if you can kind of create those nuggets before and create those processes, which then forces a, a whole bunch of other changes. But that for me is one example that makes all the difference from something that divides a team as opposed to something where people actually feel that the barrier to do it is a lot less. So more people participate, more people create proposals and so on and suggestions on how to improve it. And you benefit from everyone's input and intelligence instead of being such a, oh, is it going to pass? Is it not going to pass? I right. don't know. It's like shifting the target, right? It's saying actually exactly. it's, not, it's not going to, you know, so if you're a DAO, you know, a DAO operator, DAO contributor, DAO steward, someone, it doesn't matter where you are in the acknowledged hierarchy of DAOs because they are there, right? Whether or not you acknowledge them. <laughs> 100%. Uh, this is definitely a great way to think about this, right? Because you're essentially saying change your goal from accept or, or you know, reject this proposal to collect intelligence from those who are going to be affected and co-design the proposal to a better outcome, right? And the outcome is, of course, keep an eye on the outcome, but you're not shooting specifically from zero to one to that, right? I think that's a really good point because from my experience in DAOs as well, I'm in you know, Prime DAO and I also recently joined Gnosis Guild where we are, I think we're working with you folks a little bit on, on the DAO pattern library. But I think one of the key things that I've noticed as well is that by the time a proposal comes to a vote, like 90% of the time it's already going to pass because what's happened is behind the scenes, someone has said, hey, you giant bag holder, we're going to, we're, we're doing this proposal. We need you to vote for it. <laughs> right. So yeah. it's mostly ceremonial at that point. And so this, what you just described is a great way to pull out the behind the scenes uh, stuff that's happening as well, because in addition to collective intelligence, you're re maybe even revealing the power dynamics, right? Someone might come out and say very early and say like, Oh, this is the thing that's clearly bad for the whales in this style, but now I don't, I'm, I can't vote on it. I have to say something first, right? Like, <laughs> right? So I think that's a really uh, clever maneuver to, be, to basically say, we're going to take out token, you know, power or, you know, social power and try to get people to look at this thing we're trying to do together, right? It's lovely. Yeah, exactly. Because usually what's being confabulated is the idea that token power is equal to stakeholder representation. And they're completely different things. If you're at the, the crux of it, at the end, people come together to, because each of them have needs and they cannot satisfy them in their own. But that also means that there are different types of people. That's why the collaboration makes sense. And the organization, some people need money and they have labor to provide. Some people need to have money, but they need return on investment. They need other people to provide labor. Some people have some goods and they need someone else to buy them from them and, and so on, right? So you get these different people that are coming together. And right now in the way we're making decisions, we're not taking into account that we're coming from a different perspective. We're saying we might have a different opinion, agree this is a good proposal or bad, but we don't have a way to refine what the goalpost is to incorporate opposing points of view who might have been in conflict otherwise. So there is not space for that refinement for trying to find an option that is not your way or my way, but that actually is a win-win. And that's the crux of it is how can we create better processes that enable that that don't take into account that don't take too much time because time is also precious. And anyway, it's, it's an area we're like actively researching, maybe thinking about tools in the future and so on. But even from the processes, we can already start to make a huge change. And if the process doesn't enable that, and this happened to me, for example, in, in Aragon at some point, I created a committee, designing a committee where supposedly every member of the committee could approve things on their own. Because the whole idea was let's, let's be really lightweight, let's approve a small budgets really quickly without a lot of bureaucracy. And that way people can get a tiny budget to experiment with something. And if they want a big budget, they can go somewhere else. But for small things, we can do it quickly. And because the processes was not embedding, embedding it very quickly, that committee reverted two out of three majority to agreeing on things just because it was the more common pattern. I was like, fuck, wow. how did this happen? And no. I don't know. Yeah, that's and it's I funny. I think what you said too about the two. I think this is very common because I think that 
you know, this is maybe is going to get me into hot water, but I think that <laughs> people default to what they perceive as democratic, right? In a very simplistic way, where I often think that democ, you know, when you say well, I don't I often don't think democracy is the right choice, it doesn't mean I like dictators, right? That's not the point. The point is that there are processes up like upstream of getting it to this democratic process that involves shaping it together. Other forms of democracy that aren't just did we vote on it? <laughs> right. And so Except, yeah. and I, you're intervening in those processes does not mean that you're saying that guy's going to make the decision. All right. We're not voting on it. Exactly. Like when you have the right option for people to speak their mind, to be heard, to really be heard and participate in the process, who actually makes the decision at the end becomes a lot less important. Right now, we are obsessed with who makes a decision. And it's important. Don't take me wrong. But but it's definitely not the only important thing. The other process is way, way, way more impactful especially for how people feel afterwards, because you can have the best vision if people are not motivated for it, it's worthless. And, you know, we all fall into that trap of like trying to push through a thing. I do it myself when I'm stressed. And that's where like having some processes that can help us really, really works because you're embedding culture into the process. Like the issue with the multi sig is that it embeds these false idea of democracy that we have, yes. that is the majority voting embedded exactly. into a tool that makes it efficient. And exactly. if, if you want to move away from that, you don't really have tools to do it. So it becomes so hard to do it. So, so hard to do processes that depart from the mainstream because the tools don't enable, they enable it. And now with DAOs, I'm, I'm sometimes really excited. Sometimes like, fuck, we're just repeating the same thing because because it's very easy to start using the multi because it's a great tool and it functions and so on. And creating another tool that has a very different process that also functions and also does the basics is not that easy. And hopefully we can have that pluralism or more modular, even more modular tools than a multi sig even more customizable, like choose your own decision-making method. But the multi sig doesn't allow that, at least not at the moment. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny because I think I hearken back to this, this bit of jargon quite a bit on this podcast, but it just reminds me of the law of requisite variety, right, from, uh, from mm -hmm. cybernetics, where it's just like we're sitting here trying to govern a really complex phase space but we're expecting that to be able to do that together with multiple agents by simplifying it. it's just not going to work right like we've we've known this result for a long time right from uh, from uh, ashby and other cyberneticists from a long time ago essentially you need to have as much variety the agents need to have as much variety as the in order to engage with the full complexity and variety of the phase space they're trying to govern and if you say well actually we're going to put that into multi sig. <laughs> it's uh, it, you're not going to make it, and I think we just see that play out time and time and time and time again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and it's and again, it's really hard because even after spending over a decade thinking about this stuff, I'm so full of questions and ideas that you don't know if they're going to work or not. But the the setup of the industry is one where it's very easy to come from Web two, raise a bunch of million with a PDF. A slide deck yes and then go and start building an idea and it comes with the best intentions but until we have or unless we have a thesis of what we think a good DAO is like a great way for people to work together we're just going to build what we know from the past without even being aware that that's what we're building yeah and there is something like that's the bit that like sometimes really pisses me off and fires me is like we think that rapid iteration is all there is to innovation and through rapid iteration is the gospel just start building something and learn from users and iterate and so on but the users don't know the builders don't know and there is is very path dependent you can go and discover that actually embedding hierarchy sort of works because everyone is kind of familiar with them and yes we will probably discover that but there is also many other things you can discover but for that, you need to have a very different definition of what's the problem that you're solving. And unless we do that work first, we never get there. I think this is a, you backed into exactly the next bit that I wanted to cover with you for the last little, you know, 20 minutes we have together. So you're after Aragon, I think you left Aragon a little while back after you successfully helped them become a DAO. You're now, you know, almost doing, uh, I'd say, uh, you're, you built this meta DAO, this DAO that studies other DAOs, right? Yeah. RN DAO. <laughs> so I think this is, you know, really fascinating because we get to, you're, not only do you have takes, you know, hot takes, you're actually going in there and empirically investigating them, right? So tell us a bit about what is RN DAO? 
Yeah, there were a few a few different challenges I was trying to find solutions for that kind of led to our endow. One was, as I was saying, these Web2 entrepreneurs that come into the space with the best of intentions, but human organization is really tricky. A lot comes into it. There is economics, there is the software UX part of it. The, there is the cultural side, psychology, social. Anyway, there is all of these different forces that come into it. That means a complex field, and you can end up having a lot of unintended consequences, like the people who, with the best of intentions, created a bribing protocol. And it starts as a fun idea, and people get excited, and then you build it, and it's like, ah, yeah. But this yeah. kind of fucks up all of these other stuff, which now yes. needs reinvention. Yep, yep. And Oh, just to be clear too, Daniel's specific, you're referencing Curve, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, Where, which is a protocol that then gave birth to something called Vote Escrow, which we will put in the show notes. But essentially, you know, you have people participating in a decentralized finance protocol who then accrue votes to where various things, lots of things, but where to direct their yield, where to make investments, what next market ma- pairs to market make, and there are incentives attached to all of these. And someone rightfully like daniel said said you know this is a lot of stuff for one person to manage what we should do is wrap it up in a platform where we can deliver the rewards to people if we aggregate their votes <laughs> on how the platform directs its finances and all of a sudden you just have a bunch of people who are like yeah this is really too complicated for me to figure out i'll just collect a bunch of rewards and then you have cent- they're not central they're still ostensibly decentralized entities but they're massively arrogating votes and then saying making decisions on their own behalf and not for the, necessarily the benefit of the people who sent them the votes and then again we've just recreated inadvertently like you said with the best of intentions a, an almost dystopian <laughs> sort of voting process for that essentially becomes bribes yeah <laughs> essentially unfortunately and is the thing is that when we try to scale up and we start solving one problem at a time, at the beginning is like how to get product market fit and create something of value. Then is how to get it to more people. Then is how do you actually manage this thing at scale? And then before you realize, it's like, well, now there is all of these people whose salary and livelihood and investors and so on who have skin in the game and they're expecting this thing to succeed. And someone else is doing something that's a bit similar, but now the space is not so big anymore. So how do we do to be a little bit better than them? And then the next step and the next step. And before you realize, it's like you end up creating corporations and we're back to where we started. <laughs> and one, one small problem at a time. And what I was hoping to do with Aaron Dow is like, can we do some way to preempt this path? And for me, organizations are, if you think about cuisine styles, is you have all of these different ingredients that need to come together and they are mutually reinforcing. If you're trying to make an Asian dish, you need like some chili and some ginger and some other stuff. If you're trying to make a corporation, then you have like hierarchy of decision making, which then means that the people at the bottom are not intrinsically motivated. So then you need some sort of HR to do performance management or performance appraisals. And these different ingredients, the top-down decision-making, then also means that you need forecasting and that becomes another ingredient that comes into it and so on. And all of these things work together. And then to make it work and align people, then you need OKRs. And that gives you the KPIs that work for the performance management, which work for the decision-making model that you have. And they all work together really well and have created organizations that are pretty good, also they have a lot of flaws. If you want to start tearing these apart, the issue is that you need to replace all the ingredients. If instead of doing some sort of, I don't know, Vietnamese dish, you want to do a French dish, you need to replace like most of the ingredients. Maybe you can keep one, but then you are going to have the cream that works together with the meat, that works together with the pepper sauce, that works together with the potatoes and so on. You cannot just add a bunch of chilies into a traditional French dish. Most likely it's going to be terrible. There is some fusion cuisine that works well, but there is more the exception than the norm. Even today, if you go to a city, most restaurants are still specialized in a specific thing. And organization is the same thing. It's like it's a self-reinforcing system where you have all of these other things that mitigate or solve the problems that another part of the organization creates. So if you have a functional divided organization, that's going to create a whole bunch of integration issues. If you create these multidisciplinary teams, that's great. But then who mentors? The people in the team, they need another mentor. So then you need to have some sort of other structure that allows you to do that thing. And you need to have some sort of guilds 
or tribe or some other learning communities to balance that other bit there. And, and so when you start to build one piece and then another and another, which is the issue sometimes with the progressive decentralization is you're putting all the ingredients there for a French dish, but then you want to make Italian cuisine down the line, that's going to be a bit problematic because you already have your French dish cooked. And then you're like, what if we add some tomatoes to, I don't know, to my speed roast? Can you add tomatoes to a speed roast? I don't know. Maybe that works, maybe not. And so I was like, can we preempt this path a little bit and have a vision of DAOs so that we can start to put together all the different ingredients that need to go, come together to make that work? And if we can do that, then loads of things are going to need to be built. And that's not something we can do alone. So we actually need to work with the rest of the ecosystem to do that. And even that thinking is not something we can do alone because it, it's a lot of thinking. It requires learning and deconstructing and bringing, boiling down a whole f- bunch of things to first principles mm-hmm. and reinventing a lot of things that we do and take for granted that would actually end up and those leading us to the wrong type of cuisine, to the wrong type of organization. organization yeah. Right. Uh, Because it's not easy. It requires so many different components. How do people understand leadership and how do they understand career paths and how do you do contractual relationships and how does the legal part works with that and how does the decision making model and it's a whole puzzle and the pieces need to fit together. Otherwise, it's it's a mess. And that's what's happening in a lot of DAOs is we're trying to bring some elements from the other, some elements from the here, somewhere in the middle. And that's human and it's imperfect and it's okay. But if we can try to understand what a cohesive framework is, maybe we can avoid a lot of the issues. And that requires and so a group effort. I mean, that, that is, was the, the original decision. We have a small delay. That's playing yeah, and so the, this is basically, you know, you went through a, the space of, essentially you covered this in an interesting way where you touched on everything that is not a smart contract in a multi-sig, which is great, right? Because it's basically <laughs> by a subtraction, you kind of covered the space of things that are DAO is interested in helping DAOs figure out from their investigations. So tell us a bit more about how it works. What is your operating model, right? Like you, there. If I think back to like Web two type companies, you know, folk, people could look at what you do almost as like a a service organization or, you know, a professional services org or something that maybe is going to post some content marketing out there trying to track some leads, you know, close them and what have you, right? How is what you're, how are you folks going around to trying to educate the space and engage with it? Yeah. So at the basic is not particularly radical, but it brings multiple elements together, which starts to be too broad. And that causes some problems, which then I'll explain how we solve and why that's the way it kind of comes together. So the first bit is we focus on research. And so we have a bunch of people who are very good at research. Like one of my co-founders used to lead user research in Google Suite and before in Asana. And we have folks from academic backgrounds and so on and user researchers and so on. And then we use that ability to do research very well, which fundamentally means we know how to understand what users want and what they need, like not only what they want, but also what they need, and you need to get both. And we then can boil down the problem space to first principles so that we can play around with them and not just build a faster course, but understand that the actual principle is how to get from A to B and then look around what are the options, what does the technology offer us to get from A to B, pick up the best option, what are the constraints, blah, blah, blah. Here is, a, here is now a solution space, like a sort of idea of how we can solve that problem. And then we can strategize around uh, prototyping that solution or at least pick the right problem to solve from the beginning so you're not solving a problem no one cares about. So with that research capability, we do research agency or what we call uh, somewhat sarcastically uh, product market fit as a service because obviously product market fit takes more of that. But is gotcha. we run a research sprint with a client Uh, We go understand the users, understand the problem, and then strategize with them what is the right way to what, like, at least what are the problems that we're going to prioritize and then figure out with the capabilities you have, the capabilities that you want to have as an organization, what's your bet? And then let's start experimenting there. And, And so we run these product strategy workshops with them. We use that same research capability to do public good research. So we apply for grants from different organizations that support us, and we solve problems that are kind of broad for the ecosystem. 
And we use that same research capability sometimes, like we have early stage projects, they couldn't necessarily hire us as an agency or it doesn't make hand. It makes sense. They need more ongoing support or more mentorship on how they do their own research, how they go about trying to find product market fit themselves. Mm -hmm. And so we bring them into our endow and help them do that. Of the back of that research, then what happens is we start to accumulate expertise on how to DAO, because we're researching all of these problems around. And we reapply the same expertise to ourselves. They obviously are part of the value that we can give to clients in these strategy workshops and so on, but we reapply them to ourselves. And so we start to create this DAO platform also because we need to suffer from these problems ourselves to empathize if we don't understand them, if we're operating as a centralized team trying to really understand the mindset of someone working in a decentralized organization, it's going to be a lot harder than if we are that same person, at least to some degree. Anyway, there are, that also creates some problems and there is other techniques, but that would be a, a different rabbit hole. So once we start to create um, that platform, this DAO, the other idea that comes to mind is what's the limit of how many of these opportunities can we tackle at the same time? How many problems can we go and research and so on? And usually organizations have to be very focused on one thing. Like um, we're going to focus only on decision making. We're going to focus only on contractual relationships. We're going to focus only on this other thing. And instead of that, like we're trying to keep it all very packaged and focus around what we call empower humane collaboration, which you could call how to DAO, but it doesn't necessarily need to be about... Anyway, around the current shape of DAOs is more about how people can work well together. End of the day, that's the goal. Whether we call it DAO in five years from now or not, the empowered human collaboration should roughly still stay with that. And, you know, that's another discussion we could have. But No, that's good. Though. One, one, sorry to cut you off. I do think that the empowering human collaboration brings up a really interesting point because nowhere in there are you ideologically or otherwise committed to DAOs as a form. Right, you're basically just saying like we are interested in how empowering more humane collaboration. It might take the form of a DAO, but it doesn't necessarily have to. Is that about right? Are you? Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and well, you know, and then that brings us to, I guess, the question of that you were starting of what's a DAO. And if you ask a lot of people right now, what's a DAO? The, we did some research around this, and what people agreed is there should be some decentralization of power and some other characteristics. But one of the top four was there should be a treasury that is gover- governed by decentralized voting mechanism. And, and that's the bit where I was like, that is a little bit rigid. And fine, that's what people define in average as a DAO. That's what most people can agree. This is a key criteria for a DAO right now. That's where we are at. I don't think that's where we're going to be in five years from now, because even voting on itself has many limitations. And it's good for some things, but it's terrible in other cases. So we need to break these down into a more nuanced understanding of the problem. And the other thing is DAOs, especially at the time, like a year ago, but even before, they used to be very monolithic. And we, what we were trying to create was more this platform for innovation, where you can have smaller teams that are some of these specific problems. We can empower them to go and pursue their thing and they're super passionate about it. And we're going to start with a research initiative. Maybe in the back of that research initiative, we discover some problem opportunities, a little bit like Prime DAO did, start with a research initiative, discover some opportunities, end up building three, four different products. We were like, that's a really cool thing. Can we systematize that? Can we create a platform that enables teams and ideas to, to follow this flow? And if we're going to do that, it's not something that we can plan centrally. We cannot figure out very well what are the best things because what matters most sometimes than what's the most interesting problem is do we have a fit in between the problem and a group of people who are really passionate to go and explore it? And that's really hard to plan centrally. So instead of that, it's more taking this platform approach. And the other bit is, well, how do you allocate funds between all of these different teams who are trying to explore things to one another? Mm-hmm. And where most DAOs are right now is that they have a centralized decision-making model system to make funding allocation. And that can be one, the CEO, and they are not really a DAO, or well, we can debate yes, that. That's or, definitely or one even, of my favorite jokes. That should take yeah. me to the CEO of the DAO, please. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But I argue that if you have a, a single voting mechanism, and that's the only way to get funds, is still a centralized system 
for distributing and managing funds. Even if the infrastructure is based on blockchain and hence distributed or decentralized tech infrastructure, whatever, as far as the behavior of this socio-technical system, that's still a single mechanism to do it, which means that everyone is going to flock to this mechanism, which means that the whole organization is going to be preoccupied on how to play around the dance of who gets to get money out of this system. And so you we have these organizations, and this is the issue of DAOs that raise a lot of funding, is everyone is playing politics on how to increase the budget of their own team to go and do the thing. And then these teams compete instead of collaborating. And how do you actually get money to create a bigger vision? And so you rely on people being a little bit enlightened and self-sacrifice themselves a little bit for the benefit of the greater DAO, the greater community and so on. But are you even a community or are you just fragmented and anonymous yeah. and whatever? So, so instead of that, we wanted to, to piece this differently. And the way to allocate funds is a lot less about one central place where you can get money from. And it's a lot more, can we be hungrier and try to get validation from the problem from the outside? Like, is anyone going to pay us to solve this problem? Yes or no. If no one is going to pay us, then it's probably not that big a problem. Second is, are we hungry enough to go through that pain of going and applying for grants and so on, which is a nightmare and you get very little money out of it. Yes. But if you can go through that, you actually have something pretty solid. And then as these teams start to mature, can these teams offer product and services to each other? So all of these teams are the clients. So if the marketing team needs to hire someone else, well, they can hire the HR team or they can hire someone else within the community to provide that service to them. And so we start to create an internal marketplace for allocating funds internally, this, which, yeah, anyway. <laughs> this is great. I love it because basically you're, and Martin knows quite, probably knows more about this than I do, but you're achieving almost like the, the cozy vision of transaction costs between silos of an organization, like essentially foregrounding and making legible the transaction costs between parts of an organization. And, you know, Sears, I believe, tried this years ago. I don't remember how, I believe it ended up not being great, but basically it's interesting because, you know, Sears, it's a, a, a huge American retailer. I don't know if it's actually still around, but this was like, I think the 70s or 60s, but basically they, they tried this and, you know, that doesn't mean that it can't work. It's more like, if you're working in an organization of 50,000, 100,000, 500,000 people, it, you can definitely do this, but it requires a different level of engagement and a different type because, you know, Sears is ostensibly a gigantic corporate entity that then power rolls uphill and all the things we basically covered already, you know, come back and surface themselves again in this type of organization in terms of power dynamics yeah. and decision making. One thing I wanted to really ask you and dig in on a little bit before we end here in a, uh, shortly is you mentioned producing work for public goods, right? And I think that's super interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What have you discovered so far that, you know, in, in your two domains, there's really two, I think of the domains of knowledge you're exploring in two ways, right? There's one, you're going out to, to DAOs, you're working with them, you're co-defining problems that they actually have and that they'll pay you for. And then you're learning from that. And then on the other side of it, you're learning from introspection and, reflect, and being a reflexive organization that kind of says, we're also doing this. How can we do it better? So from those two things, you're producing a, a corpus of knowledge that then says, hey, as a public good, here's what everyone else needs to sort of know in our learning journey. So what have you sort of learned so far that you've open sourced? One of the big ones that we have open sourced recently is the, this was a free four month project around community health, because we are seeing a lot of people in Twitter asking, how do I measure community? And in general, people know how not to measure it. Number of members in Discord, bad metric, doesn't mean anything. Amount of messages per day, bad metric, doesn't mean anything. When there is a huge argument, the messages goes up. When there is something really good, positive happening, the messages go up. We know that no messages, people not talking to each other is bad, but we don't, but other than that, we don't really know. So we, we plunge into this question of how can we tell apart a community that when a shock happens, they're going to fall apart from a community that when that's, when a shock happens, they're going to come together and become stronger. And anyway, it's a long story, but like we have now shared uh, a couple of articles on that. One is uh, a short summary that you can find in your blog. Another one is the, the whole research paper that's like 38 pages on, on this topic with loads of academic uh, references and it's kind of dense and geeky but if you're passionate about it i fully recommend it 
And awesome. and now what we're doing is trying to translate that to practice and action it. And so got also a few grants to build a data collection tool so that the or data scientists that help me develop this framework can crunch the data and we can start to validate and translate it to, to practice, which is kind of this sort of pipeline of starting by solving a problem with the ecosystem, helping everyone understand how to frame that problem mm -hmm. and then create tool tooling that enables the more positive behavior. Because you're like, okay, measuring the number of messages or the number of message of people in Discord is wrong. But yes. if you want to measure the right thing, how the hell do you do it? And if you have to invent it in-house, that's a lot of work. So instead of that, can we build coalitions and partnerships and so on to bring these solutions, these enabling solu enablers right, right. to the market and help this shape a, the, the narrative? An interesting one, actually, because we had Joshua Tan on the podcast, I think, early, I think, you know, 13 or 12. But basically, he's almost like a technical foil to you on the other side of this, because the what I'm thinking of is, you know, the Dow Star One initiative, which I think that you're, you folks are a part of, right, is... They've developed this thing that's a general purpose tool, the API gateway, which we spoke to him as well. You can aggregate your community's inputs from Slack, from Discord, from Twitter, from whatever, and ostensibly even Telegram, and you can have a point of view that says, like, here's your community, right? But uh, as Joshua found, that's just, it ends up still being a ton of noise, right? It doesn't really tell you much about community health. So I feel like you're really on the opposite, on, not the opposite, you're on the complementary side of this, saying, like, great, but now let's actually look at from almost strictly empirical anthropological sense what are the vectors of data and experience and you know qualitative and otherwise that inform what api gateway can tell you about the health of a community the sound about right yeah to some degree i mean so they had created these if i'm unless i'm mixing it they also had these ethnographic tool uh, that was really fantastic and you could get a lot of really detailed insights the place that we're coming about to it is mostly from a network science perspective or specifically organizational organizational network analysis, mm -hmm. which I sort of discovered this a few years ago. There is a guy called Alex Pentland, and he wrote a, a popular book that was called or, uh, Social Physics. And so he was starting to do some research on this. And he's by no means the only one. There is many amazing researchers in this that have advanced this field for the last 30 years or more. And but they were starting to understand, for example, that teams that have a more even communication pattern, where it's not just one person talking, but everyone kind of takes turns mm -hmm. and the volume, simply the volume of communication is more even, they perform better. And so it was like these sort of insights that you could extrapolate to a whole community that can be really powerful when you don't have necessarily the resources to look very detailed and join every team. So when things start to be a little bit bigger, or even when you're so caught up into the day-to-day -day that you're not reflecting on these things, you realize it's like, well, this is working, but also it's fragile. Simply by your communication pattern, we can know that. And so we can feedback these to the teams and create that sort of positive feedback loop where the team can then be like, oh, maybe let me adapt my behavior. Because the idea is not, okay, so you have a, the wrong communication pattern, so now you don't get the bonus. Because <laughs> then people find ways to game the system. Instead of, of that, right? Instead of that, it's like, can we bring these data to the people actually doing the work and make it meaningful for them on a regular basis so they can improve their behavior and it becomes more like your coach sort of a pro sort of relationship Absolutely. in between data and community. And, and that's kind of like the direction that we're ex exploring at the moment, mostly for community managers, but with the possibility to expand into these other areas. Very cool, man. Well, I think like what I really got out of this so far, and which I think this might surprise some people, but I'm constantly kind of measuring my own confidence against the this space of DAO organization potential, right? And I, if you look at it as a spectrum, I'm like, you know, if you think of it as a number line, right, where zero is exactly neutral, I'm basically constantly at minus one and, and where it's like DAOs are not going to make it, <laughs> basically. And it's and for a number of reasons, you kind of hinted at, right? And I think that it's refreshing to actually see someone come in here with a, I wouldn't call you skeptical, I'd say you're a hopeful skeptic, maybe, right? But it's more, you're not committed to DAOs as the form, you're very much committed to 
more humane collaboration. And it's very cool to see how it materializes in the tools, the thinking, and the self-organization of what RMDAO is doing. So I just want to thank you for sharing all that with us. And the, the last bit I wanted to sort of throw your way is, you know, you left, out, you left it off on a really good spot for this is uh, please take a few seconds, a minute to chill. Tell us where to find you online, how to get involved. Um, if this sounds interesting to you, where do we find you? Thank you very much for, for this conversation. I, I really enjoyed it. I love the references to cybernetics. And, and it's fantastic to have you know, someone who's also seen some of these other, uh, other pockets that somewhat get buried in academia and so on. But to, to find us, the, the easiest thing is Twitter. And you can find at rndao underscore underscore or myself is at underscore daniel underscore ospina that's o-s-p-i-n-a also there is the our website which should be live at some point we just change it but is rndao.info and if you're interested in in seeing the the research that we have open source that's rndao.mirror.xyz other than Sears, other people who have tried this slightly more recently is Sappos, actually. It's gone in this direction after Holacracy. And, oh, the, okay. and then there is also Hire, a Chinese manufacturing company that has 80,000 employees. And it's absolutely crazy. So if anyone is interested in geeking out in organizational models, fully recommend those two to check out on top of, well, if you're interested to to talk governance and stuff, just feel free to DM me and I can share some of the plans. I would love to to hear your best criticism of it. Awesome. Thanks a lot for your time, Daniel. This has been fantastic. No, thank you very much. All right, Daniel. Thanks a lot, man.